since you're up, just come on. Okay? Or Miss Heather, Miss Samantha, Miss Jessica, y'all look y'all down. And they're going to sing something for y'all. Amen.
the next couple of Wednesday nights uh, to finish it off and to cover all of it. Uh, and so we'll be in Exodus chapter number 25, and uh, we'll say a few things, and then we'll be in Hebrews chapter number 9. Exodus 25 and Hebrews chapter number 9. All right, Exodus 25, if you would look at verse number 17. And thou shalt make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof. Let me stop right here and say this. If you're wondering what a cubit is, it's from your elbow to the tip of your finger. Amen. That is a cubit in your Bible. Uh, generally, it's accepted. That's about 18 inches. All right? Amen. thought I'd throw that in there. Look at verse 18. And thou shalt make two cherubims of gold. Of beaten work shalt thou make them in the two ends of the mercy seat. And make one cherub on the one end and the other cherub on the other end. Even of the mercy seat shall ye make the cherubims on the two ends thereof. And the cherubims shall stretch forth their wings on high, covering the mercy seat with their wings. And their face shall look one to another. Toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubims be. And thou shalt put the mercy seat above, upon the ark, and in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee. Notice verse number 22 of the ark text tonight. And there I will meet with thee, and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubims, which are, which are upon the ark of the testimony, of all things which I will give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. Let's pray. Father, we sure do love you. Pray that you give us clarity of mind and speech. Pray you illuminate the word of God. Help us, Lord, uh, as we try to dig, dig this thought out and pray, Lord, you would drive it down to the hearts of your people. May you help us. And Lord, may you bless the message and the messenger. May you bless the listener. May you help us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Tonight, what I just read to you is the Lord is giving instruction to Moses about building the Ark of the Covenant. Amen. I did not take the time to read the entire chapter. But when you read that, you'll find that God instructs Moses to build the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant basically is a big old box. And it is made of wood, and then it's overlaid with gold completely. And then on the top of the box, as a lid, if you will, God says, uh, make a mercy seat. And on that mercy seat, I want two cherubim. Now, you must remember that cherubims are different from angels. They are not the same. The cherubims, seraphims, and angels are the three classes of heavenly beings. But a cherubim is different. Angels don't have wings. Right. I know you see all the stuff on TV and you see all the stuff, the angels with wings. But angels don't have wings. Scripturally, cherubims have wings. Yeah. Right. And so there is a difference. And uh, he said, I want those two cherubims to sit on top of that lid, on that mercy seat, and I want them to face each other. Then I want their wings to come out and cover the entire top of the box uh, on the mercy seat. And he said, that is where I'm going to meet with you and deal with you and talk to you and give you commands, and that's where I'm going to fellowship with you, according to verse number 22. And so the Old Testament is filled with shadows and types. And God uses these shadows and types to reveal New Testament truths to the Christian. Amen. God shows us the picture of the thing in the Old Testament. Then he reveals the truth of that thing in the New Testament. Now, in our text, we read a great truth. Now, many times when we read our Bible, we simply read this and move on without giving much thought to it. And it seemingly has no bearing on the New Testament Christian. In the passage, God's dealing with Moses about building the Ark of the Covenant. And he gives him very specific instructions, and he gives him all the details he'd need. Uh, he even tells him what materials he's to use. He tells him the dimensions, the height, the width, and the depth. And he tells him it's to have cherubims resting on the top of the lid. And he gives him detailed instructions concerning the posture and the position of these cherubims. And so, tonight, the Lord 
uh, wants to reveal something to us that's very important in this text. Uh, it would do us good to take note of verse number 22, uh, according to that passage, uh, and many others. God would come down and meet with his servants, the priests. It was there where the presence and power of God would dwell. It is between those two cherubims where God would manifest himself. It's there where God would reveal himself and show himself to his servants, the priests. It was on top of this ark where God promised to meet with, to meet with and instruct those priests. Now it's important to note not everyone was allowed back in the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant was. Yeah. It was very specific. Only the priests were allowed back there. It was a right reserved solely for the priests. Now you realize the same is true in our day. Uh, the presence of God is not for everyone. It's for those who have been born again. It's for those who have experienced the new birth and have been saved by the grace of God. In Revelation 1.5, this is what the Bible says. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us, and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests, unto God and his Father. And you realize spiritually when God saved you, he made you a priest. Right. And so we have access to the presence and power of God, similar to what they had in the Old Testament. It was for the priests alone. They would go back there, the Spirit of God would come down and meet with them, instruct them, give them commands, tell them what to do, tell them how to fix problems. And brother, the same is true for you and I. Because we've been saved and have been spiritually made priests, we have access to the Spirit of God. Amen. Now, uh, just like the, the Ark and the of the Ark of the Covenant in the Old Testament. Now there's several verses that reveal this truth concerning God meeting with His priests on the top of the Ark. Numbers 7, verse number 89. And when Moses was gone into the tabernacle of the congregation to speak with him, then he heard the voice of one speaking unto him from off the mercy seat that was upon the Ark of the Testimony from between the two cherubims, and he spake unto him. 2 Samuel 6, 2, And David arose and went with all the people that were with him from Baal of Judah to bring up from thence the ark of God, whose name is called by the name of the Lord of hosts, that dwelleth between the cherubim. There's a ton of these verses that confirm what we read in verse number 22, Amen. that the Lord would come down and he would dwell between those two cherubims, and that's where he would meet with his people. Now, that we've established this truth, I want to look at Hebrews chapter number 9, and try to, to begin to get into the message. Hebrews chapter number 9. Uh, I want to show you something that arrested my attention in Hebrews chapter number 9. Look at verse number 1. Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made, the first, wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer, here we are, and the ark of the covenant overlaid round about with gold. Notice the next statement. Wherein was the golden pot that had manna, and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant. And over it the cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly. Now these things were thus ordained. The priest, the priest went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. Verse 8, the Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way of the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. Notice verse 9, which was a figure. You see that? It's important. Which was a figure for the time then present, in which we were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. Now, according to verse number 9, that Ark of the Covenant is a figure. It's a picture. It's a shadow. It's a type for the New Testament Christian. Uh, I have preached I don't know how many messages about the Ark of the Covenant uh, and what it represents for the New Testament Christian. 
But tonight, there is no doubt from the scripture that we realize that that mercy seat was significant and, and that Ark of the Covenant was significant in the Old Testament for the, those, those uh, for God's people, for the nation of Israel. But God didn't, didn't give them the Ark of the Covenant just for them. He gave it that he might also paint a picture for you and I. And so tonight, I want to deal with that picture. And you may ask, what is the significance of this truth? To understand its application to you and I, we have to look at verse number four. Notice this, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold. You'll find that he lists three things that are inside that ark. Number one, wherein was the golden pot that had manna? Number two, and Aaron's rod that budded? And number three, and the tables of the covenant. In verse four, we're told the contents of the Ark of the Covenant. We're told there was manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the table of the tables of the covenant which are the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter number 20. Now these items are significant, and God is using these items to paint a picture for the New Testament believer. You will notice the presence of God was resting on the outside of the ark, but what was on the inside of the ark is important as well. Amen. It's what's on the inside of the ark that brought the power of God on the outside of the ark. And you'll find in all three instances that God tells Moses and he tells the leaders to put these particular items inside of the Ark of the Covenant. So each one of them has some spiritual significance for the New Testament believer. So here's the picture. You've got the Ark of the Covenant and God comes down and sets down on it. The presence, the power, and the person of God is manifested above that, that Ark of the Covenant. He would, uh, matter of fact, they say he dwells between the cherubims. We just read that verse. So God would come down, manifest himself between those two cherubims on the Ark of the Covenant. Now, that is no accident. Now, what's important is God thought it was important enough to tell you what was on the inside of that Ark. Amen. And so here's the picture. The picture is this. If you want the power of God resting upon you, there's some things that you have to have inside of you. Yeah. You with me? Right. Now, if you don't have these things on the inside of you, you're not going to see the manifested presence of God on the outside of you. And in order for God to rest and dwell upon us, use us and help us and uh, provide us with His presence, His power, and His person so we can find direction, we can find leadership, we can find comfort, we can find help, we can find blessings, we can find... Uh, uh, all of the things that the Spirit of God provides for the New Testament believer. Now tonight, if we're going to have that manifested presence of God, which by the way is essential for every New Testament believer, yeah. how are you going to know what to do if the presence of God, the Spirit of God, doesn't deal with you? Right. How are you going to know? Uh, how are you going to find encouragement and help and hope and, and all the things that the Spirit of God provides? There's no other place for us to get them except from the Holy Ghost Himself. He is the provider of those things. Yeah. And so tonight, if we're going to have the presence of God manifested uh, in our lives and in our church, there's some things that's got to be on the inside. And if we don't have that stuff on the inside, we're not going to see the Holy Ghost on the outside. Yeah. Right. Everybody with me? Amen. So that's the picture that is being painted uh, through, these, through these verses. When God said I, he made a promise that he'd meet with them. But he also told them, you better put this stuff inside that ark. And you know what he's saying? If you ain't got that stuff inside the ark, then I'm not going to meet with you. I'm not going to dwell with you. I'm not going to come down to the chair. Because disobedience would rob them of the presence of God. So tonight, I, I want to deal with that. And uh, try, to, try to show you these three things and what they mean scripturally and what they are a picture of uh, spiritually. So, uh, now tonight, these rules can apply, these things can apply not only to the individual Christian, but they also apply to churches. Amen. Any church that doesn't have these things is not going to see the manifest presence of God. Right. Like we see here regularly. Amen. And listen, God has been very kind to show up here and meet with us and move around this place. But if we ever lose the things that I'm going to show you, God quit showing up. And so tonight, the reason a lot of churches are dead, it's 4 o'clock and there's no presence, no power, 
and no person of the Holy Ghost present in their services is because they lack these things. And so tonight, let's look at these three things and try to examine them and make sure that we're ha we have these in our lives and in our church. And so tonight, I will, there's no way it's impossible for me to get to everything I've got to say. Uh, as I was studying today, I happened to look at the, uh, my note count, which I never do when I was typing it up, and there's probably 16 pages of notes that I, I was just working, just what happened when I got ready to, to say that I just so happened to glance down, 16 pages of notes on this thing. So we'll try to get as far as we can. We may not get all the way through the first point. Uh, but we've got until Jesus comes, so uh, if we have to cut it off this Wednesday night, you show back up next Wednesday night, and we'll pick it back up. Now, he said there was manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. And these items are significant, uh, and God's using these items to paint a picture for the New Testament believer. If you want the presence of God to rest on you and to rest in your church, you will have to have these things. And so... Uh, tonight, we're going to look at what's on the inside of the ark. And so, uh, these items in the ark reveal us how to have the power of God manifested in our lives, in our churches, and in our ministries, in our homes. Uh, and if you want God to rest on you, you're going to have to have these things. All right, here we go. Now, uh, number one, we'll deal with the manna. Number one. You realize that manna in the Scripture is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. You will find that it was sent from heaven, just like our Savior. The manna came by supernatural means. God Himself provided the manna. Right. It could not be explained. Scientists could not explain it away. But God does a miracle each and every day for these children of Israel, and He feeds them for 40 years. It is a supernatural event. Just like the Lord Jesus Christ. You know how He came? He came by supernatural means. And God sent down the manna from heaven. And the same is true for the Lord Jesus Christ. God sent Him down by supernatural means. He was born of a virgin. You'll find that He lived a sinless life and died a vicarious death. Where did He come from? He came from heaven. And uh, so, uh, God, just like God sent this manna supernaturally, He sent the Savior supernaturally. But you'll find also that this manna is described as small, which typifies and is a picture of the humility of our Savior. In Philippians 2.7, the Bible says this, But made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. He was God Almighty, yet he humbled himself, uh, and became obedient, even obedient unto the death of the cross. Here's God Almighty dying for His creation. Right. What humility He displays. Uh, up in heaven, He's running things. Down here, He takes on the form of a servant. And so it's small. And you'll find that it was round. It had no beginning and it had no end. It represents uh, Him being eternal. Uh, the Lord Jesus had no beginning and He will have no end. Uh, he is eternal. And so it, it was white. And what that represents is his purity. Uh, he was without spot, without blemish. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, Amen. that we might be made the righteousness of God right. in him. So you'll find it's purity. You'll find it was sweet to the taste. Uh, the same is true about the Savior. Anyone who's ever tried him would have to agree yeah. that he is sweet. Amen. My Lord in heaven, what a blessing. Yeah. And I just got saved because I didn't want to go to hell. I didn't realize how sweet of a Savior yeah, I was getting, how kind, how gracious, how loving, how merciful, how, how selfless, uh, how generous our Savior was. But anybody that's tried the Lord Jesus would have to admit that He's sweet. Yeah. Now you'll also find in order to get this manna, you had to stoop. You had to bend over. You had to bow. The same is true with our Savior. If you're going to receive the Lord Jesus Christ, it requires humility. Amen. You're going to have to bow. You're going to have to bend. You're going to have to stoop over. And brother, you'll not, you'll not meet Jesus Christ face to face and eye to eye. You Amen. Will Amen. God will not save a sinner that wants to look at right. the Savior in the eye. You're going to have to bow and say, Lord, I'm unworthy. I'm sorry. I'm low down. I deserve to go to hell. And when you're willing to bow and surrender, that's when you'll meet the Savior. The same is true with the man. Uh, listen, you know how they got it? They had to stoop over. And they had to bend down. They had to pick it up. They had to humble themselves in order to receive the manna. Now, the same is true about the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, uh, it's a picture of humility. 
uh, in Matthew 18, 4, this is what the Bible says. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Humility goes a long way with the Lord. When you'll admit that you're not everything you're supposed to be and you're a failure and you've messed up, when you'll get humble before God, that's when God will show up and do something for you. But as long as you are self-reliant, as long as you feel like I'm doing good, then you're no candidate for the blessings of God. And so we can't receive Christ if we don't humble ourselves about Him. Uh, now, you'll find it was sufficient. Uh, it sustained them through 40 years in the wilderness. It got them safely into the promised land. Now, the truth is tonight that Christ is sufficient to get us through the wilderness of this life and bring us safely home to heaven. You'll find the manna was on the inside of the ark and the power was on the outside of the ark. And hear me tonight. No one will have the power of God without having Jesus Christ in their heart. Amen. The power of God's not for lost folk. The power of God's for saved folk. Amen. And brother, hear me. You'll never see the touch of God on a lost man. You'll never see God anoint a lost man. That is, that is strictly reserved for the saved, for the born again. Right. And so tonight, just like he, it was reserved for the priest in the Old Testament, it is reserved for the believer in the New Testament. The Spirit of God is for the believer. Now, the Spirit of God may deal with them, convict them, draw them, and save them. But as far as anointing them and having the presence of God resting upon them, I mean, that's not for lost folk, man. That's for saved people. Amen. You'll have to be saved if you're going to have the presence of God uh, resting on you. Now, you'll find man is unusual uh, because it has a dual type. It's a type of the Lord Jesus Christ, but it's also a type of your Bible. Now, that is not unusual uh, for God to use man in two separate types. Use the same thing as two different types. You say, why? Because Jesus Christ Himself is called the Word of God. Amen. There are three that bear record in heaven. First John 5, 7. There are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. Uh, and His name is the Word of God in the book of Revelation. So it's not unusual for this manna to represent our Savior, but it can also represent the Scripture. Can I say this? You ain't going to have no touch without this book. Right. You've got to put this book inside of you. If you reject this book, guess what will happen? You ain't going to have no touch. You ain't going to have no power. You don't have the presence of God resting on you. You need to be a Bible believer and a Bible reader. If you want God's presence in your life, you want God's power in your life, you want God uh, 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 to guide you and lead you and direct you, it will take the Scripture. I, I found it unusual in Deuteronomy 8, chapter, uh, Deuteronomy 8, verse number 3. He said this, And he humbled thee, and suffered thee to hunger, and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not. Neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. In the same verse, he talks about manna and the word of God. And so manna is a type of, of the scripture. In Ecclesiastes 8.4, this is what the Bible says, where the word of the king is, where the word of a king is, there is power. And who may say unto him, What doest thou? You, you realize where the word of a king is, there is power. Amen. And so hear me, there's no power without the book. Yeah. You've got to have the book. You've got to have the book, man. And so hear me, if you try to, to uh, try to walk with God without the book, you're going to end up in a mess. Yeah. And God's people ought to be Bible believing. Bible reading Amen. people. Amen. We have to have a daily dose of this book if we're going to have the fullness of the Spirit. Now, anointed saints are Bible reading saints. Uh, powerful saints are Bible reading saints. Amen. And you'll find that the Lord honors this book. And so, brother, if you'll put that book inside of you, it draws the presence and power of Almighty God. I've been a Bible reader for 26 years. I believe this book. I can't count the times I've read it through cover to cover. Uh, I, 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 honestly, I have no idea. I know there's some years I've read it through three times cover to cover and then go back and read the New Testament a fourth time. There's times I've read it through once a year. There's times, I, you know, I've struggled, man, and I, I barely get through it in a year. There's been other times when the Lord would nudge me and I'd study it more and pray more and spend more time in this book. But I know this. more time you spend in that book, more presence of God you're going to have. Right. I know that. And so then you'll notice the size of this manna. 
in Exodus 16, 17, this is what the Bible says. And the children of Israel did so and gathered some more and some less. And when they did meet it with an omer, he that gathered much had nothing over. And he that gathered little had no lack. They gathered every man according to his eating. You know what he's saying? He said some people gathered more, some people gathered less, but it was exactly what they needed. Yeah. You know what that you know what he's trying to say, what he's trying to picture is I don't care if you've been saved three minutes, three years, or thirty years, this book will be exactly what you need. Yeah. It will fit you right down to the ground. If you don't know nothing about the Bible and you just pick it up and start reading, God will show you something. God will help yeah. you. Yeah. If you've studied it in depth and have everything, all the all your ducks in a row, then God can still show you something. It'll still feed you and it will still maintain you. It will still fill your soul regardless of where you're at spiritually. When I first got saved, I didn't know Thompson had a chain or Schofield had a note. I didn't have no idea about nothing. I thought Job was Job. Uh, I thought an epistle was the wife of an apostle. I had no idea, man, about nothing. But you know what I made up my mind? The Lord nudged me and said, read that book. I said, I don't understand it, but I'm going to read it. And so-and-so begot, so-and-so begot, so-and-so begot, so-and-so. You said, what'd you do? I read on. And this is what I did. I'd stop and try to take time to pronounce all them names. Has Gaz Shamgar. And uh, Lord knows I butchered it. But you know what I made up my mind? I was going to read that book. I knew if I was ever going to be what God wanted me to be, I would have to spend time in that book. Yeah. And so it's a picture of the Scripture. Hear me. The presence of God has come back and, and rested on that Ark of the Covenant. Now listen, He ain't going to rest on you unless you got Jesus on the inside. Yeah. But secondly, He ain't going to rest on you unless you got the book. Man, you got to put the Scripture in. you got to put the Scripture in. Right. And so it's a picture. Now, uh, may I say this? This manna also represents dependence. The children of Israel were dependent on the Lord. They had to trust the Lord to feed them each and every day. Yeah. Every day they were dependent on His grace and on His mercy. Every day they had to be dependent on His faithfulness. Every day they had to be dependent on the goodness of the Lord. And they had to wait upon the Lord every day to send them manna. Every single day of their lives, they had to be dependent. It's impossible for them to live independent of the Lord. Uh, they had to depend on Him or die. Now for the New Testament Christian, that wants God's presence and God's power to rest on them, they have to be dependent upon Him. You have to trust Him. And you're going to have to wait on Him. Amen. You're going to have to cast yourself upon the faithfulness of God yeah. and live in dependence upon Him. Yeah. If we're to have the, the power of God in our lives, we must live each and every day depending on Him. Amen. Now, hear me. He's trustworthy. You can trust Him. You say, how do you know? 26 years. I know. Listen, you, I've seen Him come through over and over and over. Yeah. This, just this week, I saw the Lord do some amazing things, man, and help me personally. You know why? Because He's faithful. You know who caused the sun to come up this morning? Yeah. The Lord. You know who made it go down this evening? The Lord. Yeah. You know who will bring it up again tomorrow? The Lord. Each and every day we live, we are dependent upon the faithfulness of God. Yeah. Here it again is the Lord uh, that takes care of us. It is the Lord that sustains us. And if we ever get to the place where we are independent of the Lord, we are not going to have the presence and power of God manifested. Hear me. Uh, we don't know how to do nothing. We need the Lord. Right. Yeah. We need His presence. We need His yeah. guidance. We need His direction. Without Him, we're nothing. We're no yeah. one. And so hear me. If you start thinking you're independent of the Lord, guess what? The Spirit of God won't dwell here. He'll withdraw. God says, okay, you got it. Go ahead. I'll let you have it. I tell this story. It's been years and years and years ago. I was a young preacher. And uh, God, I've told it here, but I'm going to tell it again because it fits. Uh, years ago, uh, I had a woman say something nasty about me. And uh, she was ugly about me. And uh, you said, you get mad? Yeah, I got mad. I was young. I was mad. I was wonderful. I couldn't believe anybody had anything negative to say about me. Now, I just think, well, at least it, at least it didn't say something worse. Spurgeon said this, be not mad when somebody says something negative about you, for you're worse than they, than they think yeah. you'll be. Yeah. Well, of truth in that. But anyway, I was mad. And uh, my pastor was out of town. He said, you're preaching Wednesday night. I thought, yes, sir, I am. <laughs> That's something for that old gal. I'm going to straighten her out. And so here's what I did. I didn't say the Lord did it. I did. I would put me together a message on gossip. 
I just basically looked through all the verses that had gossip in it. I just piled them all in. I got up that Wednesday night. She was sitting about where Brother Mike is, maybe a row or two back. And I said, God will have more mercy on a pill <laughs> than he will if somebody goes around running God's youngest down. He said, you're sticking tongue 75 foot long, and you are great to the altar. It's so long you might have to double it. I mean, for 35, 40 minutes, I absolutely come unscrewed about gossip. You said, was the Lord there? No. I doubt it. <laughs> he was there in person. He wasn't there in presence. And so I skinned everything coming in and going. I said, your tongue, it's wicked. It's under I mean, just absolutely killed the high off of it. And when I got done, I said, let's all stand. Maybe you need to get in this altar and get right. The whole church came. I am not lying. The whole church was in the altar. They were apologizing to each other and hugging necks. The only person in the entire auditorium that did not come was the woman who ran the altar. <laughs> so now, this is what it did. I did. We finished up. People weeping and crying and saying, Preacher, thank you, I needed that. And man, I thought, dear God, what's wrong with these people? I would be shooting at them. And so anyway, I go to the back, Brother Ken, and I'm shaking hands. Good to see you. Boy, enjoyed the message. Thank you, preacher. I needed that. Oh, God bless you. Here, here she comes. I thought, mm -hmm. <laughs> So she walks. I'm shaking hands. Somebody. She walks around them and slips up behind them. This is what she said. Preacher, I don't care what they say about you. I love you. <laughs> <laughs> I started saying, you have her? I was talking to you. <laughs> you know what the Lord said, Brother Timmy? You wanted to handle it. Yeah. Amen. You handled it. Yeah. And you didn't accomplish nothing. Yeah. Amen. The Lord said, now, if you wanted it handled, you should have come to me. Yeah. Let me handle it. Amen. And I learned a valuable lesson that day. That you can't make folk do nothing. That's right. You preach the truth and trust the Lord yeah. to take care of it. But when we get dependent, here's what the Spirit of God does in our life. When we get independent, I'm sorry. When, when we start become self-reliant and independent, the Spirit of God goes. He says, you've got to go on. And then he'll let you make a mess out of it. And after you make a mess out of it, he said, now you want some help? Yeah. He won't have to do that two or three times until you learn, hey, I need the Lord. Yeah. Yeah. And I learned a very valuable lesson for a young preacher. It ain't my job straightening out. It's my job to preach the Bible. That's my job. I can't help what people say. And by the way, do you really think that was going to shut her up? No. So, my point is, there's a lot of times we try to operate independent of the Lord. Right. And when we do, God's content to stand back and withdraw His presence and let you have it. He'll let you make a mess out of it. He'll let you foul everything up. And then you'll realize what a mess you got, and you'll turn around and say, Lord, help. And the Lord will say, yeah, I'd have helped you a while ago before you messed it all up, if you'd asked. And tonight, we're depending on Him, man. Yeah. I don't know how to be a good husband. Right. I don't know how to be a good preacher. I don't know how to be a good pastor. I don't know. I don't know how to be a good Bible student. I don't know how. I, I, I don't have anything figured out. And you, just like I said a while ago, you will not receive Christ without humility. You have to stoop and get it. Let me tell you how you're going to get something out of that book. Humility. Yeah. Yeah. You walk in there and open your Bible and act like you know it all. Guess what? God ain't going to show you nothing. Yeah. But if you'll go to the Lord before you read your Bible, you say, Lord, I ain't smart enough to figure this out. Lord, would you show me something? Would you help me? Amen. Would you give me something? Now you're in a place where God can show you something. God showed me something. Today, I was reading my Bible. I'm finished the book of Revelation today. And uh, the Lord showed me something. I'm not going to tell you what it is, but I'm going to preach it after a while. And, uh, but the Lord showed me something. But I told the Lord, I said, Lord, I need your spirit to show you. I need the writer to show me. Yeah. I, I ain't smart enough to figure this out. And so the Lord, through the years, has been so gracious and so kind to point things out to me as I read my Bible and deal with me. But you know why? Because I'm dependent, man. Here's the, here's the thing. Evangelism is easier as far as preaching. Now it's tougher because of the travel. Middle of the night driving hours and hours and hours. But evangelism is a lot easier. Uh, here, here's why. I can preach five messages at this meeting, preach revival, 
The next week, I'm in a different state. I preach those same five messages. This crowd ain't heard them. Yeah. So I have the, I'm not saying I do that, but I'm saying I have the potential to do that. I can preach the same thing wherever I go. Now, it's made it a little bit tougher with live stream. We've got people who watch us no matter where we're at, and they've heard the same message more than once. <laughs> ain't gonna lie. But I gotta preach what God tells me. Right. And, and so, evangelism is a lot easier. You know how tough it is to be a pastor? You've heard all my illustrations. You've heard every message I've got. So every week, I have to try to come up with something. I have to, I have to get with the Lord to get something new to feed you. Yeah. I can't keep feeding you the same old stuff. Amen. I've got to have something new, something fresh every time I stand. Yeah. Now, some of it's real good. Some of it, a little tough. But my point is, I always try to have something fresh and new <coughs> to give God young. Amen. Always. Have I ever preached the same message twice? Yes, I have. Generally, they're about five, maybe ten years apart. Stuff I preached ten years ago, occasionally the Lord will nudge me and say, preach that again. Yeah. So I do. But if you don't nudge me, I try to have something new every time I stand. You're not going to hear the same messages recycled six months or a year from now. Yeah. You know why? Because I, I, I want to have something fresh to give God young. I know preachers that they'll preach something, that they'll preach these, these messages at their church, and then a year later, they'll go through them again, preach them again. A year later, they'll go through them again and again. And, and they, they do that. But listen, I don't want you to have to, I don't want to feed you uh, leftovers. Yeah. I want to give you something fresh and something new. You know what consumes 80% of my time as a pastor? Studying. 80% of my time is spent trying to dig and, and pray and get the Lord to give me something new so I can feed you something new. Amen. That's a fact. You know how you get something new? You, you tell the Lord, Lord, I don't know nothing. And if you, and if you want to give them something fresh and new, you're going to have to show it to me because I'm not wise enough, spiritual enough, or good enough to pull it out of there myself. So you have to show them. I'm just being honest, man. Humility. And, and listen, if you'll stoop and you'll bow, God will show you stuff from that book. Yeah. God will teach you something. Now, I find it interesting. I will say this. I'm going to go ahead and tell you what the Lord showed me. Uh, I don't know that I'll preach it, but the Lord did show me this. Over there, um, when the Catholic Church is destroyed during the tribulation period, God's going to wipe it out. Revelation 17, 18, 19. Battle on the great. It's a mixture of the Catholic Church and Islam and all that stuff. And uh, God's going to wipe it out. And uh, during the tribulation period, they'll come together, be the base for the one world religion, and God's going to drop a hammer on them. Revelation 17, 18, 19. That's where I was at. Uh, 20, 21, 22. And one, I found it interesting. One of the things it says about, the, about, about that church, it says, and an angel took a great millstone and cast it into the sea. And I thought, that's interesting. And just at that moment, the Holy Ghost spoke to my heart and said, do you remember the other time I used a millstone? It says, if you hurt one of these little ones, it's better for a millstone to be hanging about your neck and cast into the sea that needed hurt one of these little ones. May I remind you of all the sexual scandal with children? Yeah. Amen. Amen. That's good. Yeah. It ain't no, it ain't no, you can't beat that book. Yeah. It ain't no accident. God said when he's destroying it, he, he has that angel drop a millstone in the water. And you've heard about all the abuse and all that stuff with the Catholic Church. And then the Lord, my mind went to that verse where he said, if anybody you better to have a millstone hanged about your neck cast into the sea than to harm one of these little ones. And I thought, how fitting. That's how you can't beat that book, man. Right, right. That book was right. 2000, listen, since that book came out, it's been right. It'll be right until the end of time. Yeah. You say, how do you get that stuff? I don't. I tell the Lord, Lord, I ain't got no sense. I need some help. Lord, them folks are, are looking at me to feed them and to help them. And I don't have the wherewithal to, to accomplish it. I need you to show me something. Amen. And he does. I never will forget one time I was reading my Bible. I was in Luke 15, the story of the prodigal. This ain't been too awful long ago, several, well, several years ago. And I was reading it, and as I read the story of the prodigal, this is what I thought. Ain't nothing else in there. I've preached that sucker up one side, down the other. For 20 years at that time, about 20 years, I've been preaching. Brother Timmy, I preached that sucker lost. I preached him saved. I, I preached everything. I preached on the older brother. I preached on the younger brother. I preached on the father. 
I preached it every way you can preach it. And, and just it flashed across my mind. I thought, there ain't nothing else in there. I've mined that dry. And the next week, God gave me 11 messages on the product. Yeah. <laughs> There's more in there than what you think. And by the time you start thinking you got it figured out, God cuts you off and the Spirit of God will withdraw. Right. That man is a picture of dependence. You know what would have happened if God wouldn't have fed him? That died. Yeah, right. There wasn't no Walmarts. Right. There wasn't no Longhorns. They're out in the middle of nowhere. They are totally dependent upon the Lord. Amen. And the Lord came through Amen. every time. There's a reason God had to put that manna in that ark and then the power of God rests on it. God's trying to tell you and I we've got to be dependent upon Him. Right. And if we ever get independent of it, we'll lose the touch of God. Now, not only does it represent dependence, but can I say this? It represents obedience. He told them over there in Exodus like 16. He told them gather, to gather it every day. Just get enough to get you through the day. And tomorrow you'll have to gather more to get you through that day. Except for on Friday. Then you'll gather two days worth to get you through the Sabbath. But at the beginning, they didn't follow his instructions. They tried to hoard it up and tried to gather a bunch of it to get, the, to get it to last them several days. You know what God does? He curses it and it bread worms and it stank. Yeah. Yeah. God didn't want them hoarding it up. God wanted them to be obedient and do what he told them. He wanted them hunting for it every day. Amen. And in order to get the blessing of the manna, they had to gather it every day. They had to do it God's way. I can picture them just because I know people. And uh, brother, I can picture them the first day it goes out, they go out and gather enough to feed an army that will last them a week. And they'll say, now we don't have to fool with it. They get up the next morning, it's got worms and it stinks and it's awful. They have to throw it out. You know what God did? God said, that ain't what I want you to do. I want you to be obedient and I want you to get out of bed every morning and I want you to go gather enough for that day. Give us this day our daily bread. Sound familiar? Amen. Came out of the mouth of your Savior. Yeah. God's, God, a lot of times God's not going to give you enough to last you a month. Yeah. God's going to make you honey every day. Amen. Keep you dependent on it. And if you try to do it any other way, God's, God's not going to bless it. He's going to curse it. Right. And you know what it's going to do? It's going to rob us of the power of God. We have got to be obedient when it comes to the presence of God. Listen, I, it ain't like I prayed for God's power five years ago and ain't prayed about it since. No, you have to hunt Him every single day. I don't just hunt Him on Sunday. But when I get home tonight, I'll hunt Him again. And tomorrow. And Friday. And Saturday. And Sunday. And I'm not even preaching Sunday. Sydney Weaver is. But you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go hunt the Lord. Because I've got to be dependent on Him every single day. I've got to be obedient to Him. It's not a one-time deal. It's a daily deal. Give us this day our daily bread. Amen. You can't be a part-time Christian and have full-time power. Now, whether I'm preaching Sunday or not, I'm going to go hunt the Lord. And I'm going to go pray, and I'm going to read my Bible, and I'm going to go try my best to walk with God. Am I a failure? Absolutely. Do I mess up? Absolutely. Have, have I uh, failed the Lord miserably? Absolutely. But it ain't because I ain't hunting. Amen. God wants our obedience. You can't be disobedient and expect the presence of God to set down on you. He won't do it. Tonight, that man typifies several things throughout the scripture. And tonight, these things are essential if we're going to have God hover over us in the presence of God, settle in on us, anoint us and use us. Can I say this? If we're going to have God settle in this place, we've got to follow the picture, the type that he's given us. Tonight, we've got to be obedient. We've got to be dependent. We've got to stay in that book. And we've got to have the Savior in our heart. Amen. If we're going to have God just, His presence just hover over us. Tonight is essential. And so I'm not, I'm going to stop right there. And we'll pick up number two next week and see how that goes. And uh, then, Lord willing, the following is we'll get number three.
And so can I say this? Take the advice. God you know what God told Moses? He said, I want you to gather up that manna, put it in a golden pot, and I want you to stick it uh, in that ark. Then, after you get it in the ark, the presence of God's going to come down on you. You reckon that's an accident? No. God's trying to show you and I something. Amen. We have got to stick in that book. We have got to have the Savior in our heart. We've got to stay in the book. We've got to be dependent upon Him. And we've got to be obedient and do it the way He said it. Amen. Amen. Our Father, God, tonight we're grateful, thankful for the book. Thank you for the pictures, shadows, types, Lord, that you've shown us. Thank you for the figures that you've given us. Lord, I pray we'd pay attention to them. I pray we'd see the truth in them. Lord, I know you gave it to those Old Testament Jews for a reason. But Lord, I understand one of the reasons you gave it to them was it could be a figure for the New Testament Christian. Lord, we need the presence of God. We need your command, your direction, your leadership, your comfort. Lord, we need you. And Lord, tonight I pray you'd help us to be mindful uh, and to be dependent upon you that we might experience the presence of God. Now tonight, Father, our church needs you. And dear God, if things are getting worse, Lord, they're not getting better. And Lord, the, the, the worse they get, the more we need you. So Lord, may you manifest your presence with us Sunday. May you help us. Lord, not because we're worthy, because we deserve it. But Father, simply because we need it. God, may you help your people. Help us to be mindful of the things that we've heard tonight. Help us to apply them, Lord, that we might see the manifest presence of God in our lives, in our homes, and in our church. We'll thank you and praise you whatever you do in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. That's all. Awesome. Father, go with us now as we go. Keep your hand over. Bless the remainder of the week. Bring us back to the next appointed hour. God, may you manifest your presence in our midst. May you bless. May you help. May you work. May you move this week. We'll thank you and praise you. Go with us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.